Let's move into the power of food and nutrition to impact mood. I'm going to give you some high yielding things here you can start doing to start improving your mood. So uh, just to start with a couple of studies, um, large study of British office workers, followed them for five years. Those who were on an inflammatory Western diet had higher rates of depression, and those that were on plant-based diets had lower risks of um, depression. And so what I want you to take away from that is you don't have to become a vegan or vegetarian, but just eating more plants helps. Um, another study showed um, a Western diet that's associated with inflammation can contribute to depressed mood. And what they found in this study was um, people who had elevated um, levels of CRP, C-reactive protein. This is kind of a crude marker of inflammation. We don't have great labs to measure inflammation, but CRP is one that is often used. Um, those who had higher levels of CRP had a higher risk factor. It, it was basically a risk factor for depression. So inflammation and diet have a lot to do with mood. Another st study that gives me hope um, showed that brief dietary changes of just three weeks improve depression. And that effect persisted far beyond the study up to three months when they checked in with these people. So food clearly plays an important role in our mental health. So here are some top nutrients I want to make sure you're getting. My approach is not for you to copy down the lists I'm going to show you for magnesium and for zinc and calcium and go and buy and eat those foods. I'm going to show you the foods that are high in these nutrients, but what I want you to do is to start adopting a diet that is just generally nutrient dense. And you may need to supplement with a multivitamin, multimineral, but I want you to know kind of what, what's important and how to kind of hone in on the foods that are going to be high yielding for you. So let's start with magnesium. And I put this picture of the pumpkin seeds and the one little almond because these are great sources of magnesium. When uh, studies show that when people are stressed or sleep deprived, magnesium levels drop. And magnesium is actually a very calming nutrient. There was a study that showed that when you replaced magnesium intravenously, it improved depression in women. So here are your food sources. It's a lot of nuts and seeds and vegetables and beans. So I'm not generally a big fan of supplements, but I think if you wanted to try magnesium, especially for anxiety um, and sleep, it's reasonable. I, I recommend getting the glycinate form, which has more systemic effects and trying it for a few weeks to a few months to see how it goes. And I generally like it to be taken at night. It's calming. It's going to help with sleep. Um, it can help with night, in, nighttime anxiety. You can also try um, a, a magnesium supplement during the, the day for daytime anxiety. I would just caution you to do it on a day where you're not driving and you're not getting a little bit too calm and relaxed. So I want you to always get everything from food first, but magnesium is one that I'm not against um, supplementing. Zinc plays a really important role in neurotransmitters like GABA, which is very calming on the brain. 5-HTP, um, which gets metabolized to serotonin and helps improve mood. So low zinc levels are correlated with depression, um, poor concentration, um, and just mood uh, liability. And there was a study that showed when zinc was supplemented, people reported um, less depression and they did better on their antidepressants. Okay, so zinc also is a, is a top nutrient for mental health. Here are some foods, here are your animal derived foods, um, seafood, beef, eggs, dairy. And then here are some other plant-based foods like beans, seeds, um, you know, and this is just a, a, a simple list. There's certainly many more foods that are good sources of zinc. So this is why starting to move towards a more plant-based diet starts helping mood because you start bringing in more of these nutrients. 
And then calcium is important. Uh, calcium is not just important for bones and teeth. I know when we hear the word calcium, that's what we think about. But low levels of cal calcium are associated with stress, anxiety, and depression. And uh, women who struggle with mood in the premenstrual period also tend to do well when they increase the calcium in their diet. So in this Korean study of women, um, those who had higher calcium intakes reported less depression. Food sources, I know we always think of dairy products, but fish and seafood are also good sources, as are all of these different plant-based foods. So again, a plant-based diet will help get more of these foods into your diet. Let's talk about the B vitamins. I can go on and on, and there are many B vitamins. I'm gonna zero in on a few. B vitamins are important for many functions. They're, they play a very central role in heart health, mental health, energy production, cell growth, blood sugar metabolism. So it's important to make sure we have adequate B vitamins on board. And I'm again, not a, not totally opposed to people taking a B complex because people are so often low. What I like about a B complex is it gives you each, um, each of the B vitamins in low levels. So I don't have to worry about people overshooting. So let's focus on three important B vitamins, B6, um, B, B9, which is folate and B12. And here are some food sources. I, and all of these uh, new B6, 9, and 12 do a lot of these functions that I've listed in the first bullet point. B6 is found in lots of animal products. So if you eat animal products, you go, you're generally going to have adequate B6 levels. Um, but there are a lot of plant sources as well. Here's an interesting one that most people don't think about, brewer's yeast. It is a, um, a strain of yeast, Saccharomyces cerevisiae, and it sort of has a cheesy flavor. So people will season food with it. Like you could put it on salads or popcorn or you know, many different things. It's also a good source of protein, but it's a good source of B vitamins actually. So especially for people who are plant-based, I highly recommend you look into this. Folate, really high in a lot of plant-based foods. Folate is the reason pregnant women take um, prenatal vitamins. We want to make sure there's enough folate to make sure that the neural tube, the, you know, the spinal cord um, develops properly. So getting all of these um, different foods in will help make sure you have enough folate. And then B12 is pretty easy to get from B12, from animal products. Um, so if you're a vegetarian or vegan, it's harder. And I always worry about people who don't eat a lot of animal products that their B12 level might be low. There are not a lot of plant sources of B12. Um, mushrooms, fermented foods, um, tempeh is fermented soy. So these are some sources, but generally um, I do check vitamin B12 levels on patients and I will supplement if they're lower than about 500 in blood when we check their levels. I like vitamin B12 levels between 500 to 1,000. So I'd rather you get it from food, but if you choose to get take a B complex, that's generally pretty safe. Let's move on to vitamin D. This molecule is amazing. It's what we call a pleiotropic molecule, meaning it just does a lot of different things. It's much more than a vitamin. It can act as a hormone. It has antimicrobial activity. So it's just really important for anybody with inflammation or autoimmunity to have adequate vitamin D levels. And when it comes to mental health, it's important to recognize that there's vitamin D receptors in brain areas associated with mood. And so um, low mood has been associated with low vitamin D based on studies. And there was this Iranian study that showed when people supplemented with vitamin D3, they reported less severe depression, okay? And there was a systematic review looking at many different studies, and this one was actually MS specific. Uh, and what they concluded was that there's a positive effect of vitamin D on symptoms of depression in MS patients. 
Okay. So I hope with any, anybody who's here with MS or auto, other autoimmune diseases or inflammatory diseases, know your vitamin D level. It's as important as the medications you're taking to treat your autoimmune condition. So uh, the recommendation generally is to get your total serum vitamin D level greater than 40. It's a rare person who can do this without supplementation. I hardly ever see anybody over 40. Most people are hanging out in the teens to the 20s to maybe the low 30s if they're not supplementing. And because many of you here have autoimmunity, I would actually like you to be an overachiever and get your vitamin D level even a little bit higher. So 50 to 60 nanograms per mil is a good total serum vitamin D level. So please check with your doctor to see what's optimal for you. But I like that range of 50 to 60 because it helps optimize the effects of vitamin D on your immune system without some of the problems th that um, high, high levels of vitamin D can cause. So for example, people who have osteopenia, osteoporosis, probably should not aim for super high vitamin D levels, much above maybe 70 or 80, because it can impact phosphorus and calcium metabolism and lead to you know calcium loss. But for most of you, a vitamin D level of 50 to 60 is, is a good target range. Food sources, that's why I've got this picture of shiitake mushrooms here. Um, not a lot of food sources for vitamin D, um, but tofu and salmon certainly help. Most of us just need to supplement. And insurance can be funny about paying for vitamin D checks. So if you don't know what your vitamin D level is and you haven't had one in the last six to 12 months, I would recommend just picking a dose of vitamin D, like 2,000 or 4,000 international units a day, take that for, two, for eight weeks and then go get tested. If you are not on supplementation, it's highly unlikely that you're in my target dose of 50 to 60. I like vitamin D3 with food um, because it gets better absorbed, especially if there's some fat in your food because vitamin D is fat soluble. And if you had to choose between what form of vitamin D to take, I would take vitamin D3 over vitamin D2. Yeah, vitamin D2 is usually um, dosed once a week. Uh, vitamin D3 is the animal form, has a longer half-life, and I generally find it does a better job of bringing up vitamin D levels. And you generally have to take it every day. Don't forget about the sun. Many of us go outside um, covered in clothes, hats, sunblock. So there's really no opportunity to get sun exposure. And if you think back to your ancestors, they weren't wearing clothes. Uh, we relied on our skin to help produce a lot of vitamin D for us. And if you think back to the last slide where I was talking about that Iranian study, how do Iranian women go out? They're covered head to toe. How can they get any sun? And so vitamin D levels plummet. We shouldn't be surprised at that. And then mood, you know, gets wacky as a result. So I recommend getting outside and connecting with sunshine. Now, even if there's no sun out, getting natural light is still useful. You have light receptors in, built into your skin. 20 minutes, three times a week, between 11 and 3 are optimal, is, is an optimal regimen for getting sun. If you have a personal or uh, family history of skin cancer, I would talk to your doctor before doing this. Um, for, but for everybody else, just going outside and feeling the sun on your skin is wonderful. And it'll have a good impact on your mood um, and, and your immune system and vitamin D and your circadian rhythms, actually. All right, so another nutrient that's really important. Again, I worry about people that are vegetarians and vegans because um, oftentimes they can get anemic and have low iron stores. Iron plays an important role in mood, in mood because it, um, it works at the glutamine and MDA receptors and GABA receptors. You know, GABA plays an important role in, in anxiety, actually. So studies show that when you get somebody's iron levels up, their mood and their level of ability and cognition improves. So iron is really important beyond just mood and cognition. Um, it's important for energy and, and many other things. So um, iron is not generally 
ordered as a as a uh, a regular lab as a routine lab so um you know if you've ever had iron issues, maybe somebody checked iron studies on you, but I would look back and see if you've had a ferritin level. Ferritin is your, um, is, it's a reflection of your iron stores. And so hopefully that number is over 50. If it's not, an, if it's not over 50, start by foods. I always like food first because our body has been um, designed to take in food and utilize the nutrients from it. And it's great to actually get your iron sources from both plants and animals because the iron in those two groups differ a little bit. So um, animal sources um, are listed here. Organ meats are actually really nutrient dense and high in, in iron. So once a week, if you wanna do an organ meat like um, liver or heart, um, you can buy them organic um, and it'll flood you with nutrients. It's just a very dense way of, of just getting a lot of nutrients and it's very efficient. But if, you, if it's not something you want to do, that's okay. There's so many other foods you could try. Um, lot, there are lots of plant-based foods that also have this plant form of iron from beans to seeds to green leafy vegetables and nuts. Okay. And then let's move on to omega-3. So um, there was an, a large study done looking at 26 different studies that were looking into the question of what is the impact of omega-3 fat on mental health? And they had over 2,000 participants. What they concluded was that the studies seemed to show that um, at about a gram a day of omega-3, with EPA making up at least half half or 60% of the omega-3 content can have some beneficial um, effects on depression. So, you know, there weren't, it wasn't looking like they, you needed to do high doses of omega-3 to get the benefit, but the EPA portion seems to be really important. And if you look at um, omega-3 supplements like fish oil, you will see the EPA and DHA listed on the back label. And you will see that the o EPA is, uh, more prevalent than the DHA component. I will say that in clinical practice, oftentimes naturopathic doctors, integrative medicine, functional medicine doctors will use much larger than a gram a day because they just feel like you need bigger doses to get that um, effect on mood. But um, if you're just listening to this and you want to experiment, I wouldn't go above a gram a day. So somewhere between a combined dose of the EPA DHA added together, um, adding up to 500 to 1,000 is probably a good place to start, okay? Do that for two months and see how it goes. If you decide to increase your dose, please talk to your doctor. We wanna make sure that you're being safe. There are a couple of issues with high omega-3 intake. Um, so do also take it as food. Again, not a lot of food sources. So I would say seafood, um, and flax seeds, chia seeds, you know, some of these foods are good sources, but it's generally not enough just to do foods to see that effect on mental health. So a trial for uh, maybe two to three months of taking um, a combined EPA DHA dose of 1,000, 500 to 1,000 milligrams is reasonable. Don't rely on what's on the front label of the omega-3 supplement because it may include other omega-3s that don't really contribute to this mood effect. So you're only looking at EPA and DHA, you're adding them up and you're aiming for the sum being somewhere between 500 to 1,000. Um, okay, so caution, blood thinner, slight blood thinner. And if you're on other blood thinners, I'd be very careful with omega-3. We generally don't like too many blood thinners on board in the same person, especially if they have different mechanisms. So you can kind of have a synergistic effect. This is especially problematic in our older patients where the brain volume has shrunk down and they fall and they can have a bleed in their head. So I always want everybody to be safe or on the side of caution, go with low doses. If you decide to go higher doses, um, talk to your doctor to make sure it's safe. And then protein is actually really quite important for anxiety and depression. It's where the raw materials for our mood molecules or neurotransmitters come from. So studies show that about one to one and a half grams of protein 
per kilogram of your body weight um, can help anxiety and depression, right? So if you are, let's say 50 kilograms, that's what, that would be 50 to 75 kilograms. Uh, I'm sorry, it would be 50 to 75 um, grams of protein per day. I think we all tend to be protein obsessed and people feel like they're never getting enough protein and they want to take protein shakes. If you eat animal products, it's not that hard to reach your daily protein goal. If you are vegan vegetarian, I would do an analysis of your diet to see how much you're getting. And then if you can't add in food sources of protein, um, that are plant-based, then I would go to a protein supplement. But generally, I don't think most people need to take a protein supplement. Now I said one to one and a half grams per kilogram of weight. I know some of you don't like the metric system. So I actually had to sit there and do math and figure out what this was in pounds. So you take your weight in pounds and multiply it by 0.45 and 0.65 to get your range. And I guess 0.5 is kind of right, right in between if you kind of just wanted the average. So be careful with overdoing protein. High protein levels suppress testosterone. This is important for men and women because testosterone is much more than a male hormone. Women have testosterone as well. Testosterone is actually a modulator of the immune system. And so if your immune system is not taking away as we would like, and you have an autoimmune or inflammatory condition, it's really important to make sure you have um, good, robust, normal testosterone levels. So don't overdo protein to drive down testosterone. Food sources. So I've gave, given you a list of plant sources. People ask me this question all the time. How am I going to get enough protein if you were asking me to eat mostly plants? Well, here are the foods. Nuts and seeds are great. Beans and legumes are great. Soy, great source of, of protein. Um, nutritional yeast, also a great source of um, protein. A couple of tablespoons is, I don't know, like maybe like eight grams of protein. And of course, um, animal products as well, if you choose to have them. So how do we get, you know, rather than going through each nutrient and trying to address each separately, here's actually the approach I want you to take. We're going to go through a whole foods plant-based diet. We're going to eat food as it grows in nature. So it's unprocessed. We're going to eat mostly plants at least 80% and eat the rainbow every day. And this is going to flood you with vitamins and minerals and all the antioxidants and anti-inflammatory nutrients that you need. So now this is something we work towards. It's not something that happens automatically, but I want you to start moving towards a plant-based diet. And by 80%, I mean, when you look at the surface area of your plate, at least 80% is covered by plants. Mm -hmm.